trying to go out for a walk every night. I'm seeing parts of my neighborhood I don't usually see. Like many cities, Toronto has figured out ways to give people space to move in the outdoors while respecting physical distancing, which involve quieting down the streets to reduce traffic volume and expanding the cycling network. Active TO encourages people to move in ways that used to feel vulnerable when the city streets were dense with traffic. I am Madian Andrade, and from the University of Toronto, this is The New Normal. I know me growing up, I had plenty of experience in exposure cycling. I was very much encouraged to do it. This is Leah Ravensbergen. She has just graduated with her PhD from the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto. And so when I moved to to Montreal to go to school, and it was very easy to just pick up a bike and cycle because I had all of this experience um, and I felt very confident. And then I brought that with me when I moved to, to Toronto. Her research examines critical mobilities and feminist urban geography, the gender gap in cycling and the use of space in cities. So I walk. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I used to jog. I'm taking a break from it for my knees. But when this started, there was certain times I would walk and through certain neighborhoods and not others necessarily and not after it got dark from in some places, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So I had all these typical sort of heavily gendered paths that I was willing to take where I felt safe. Um, mm-hmm. And then um, COVID hit and I felt it was like a buffer of safety. I, mm-hmm. I thought no one's going to approach me on the street right now. Everyone's mm-hmm. scared. More people are out at all mm-hmm. hours, um, mm-hmm. which is good and bad because I was trying to avoid them, um, <laughs> especially early on. Uh, and so that was interesting. On, Who on owns level, our public spaces? If you ask people that question about parks, I think the answer is pretty clear. It's all of us. But if you ask people that question about roads, who will they say? I think that's like an interesting uh, point that we, we think of often is, you know, streets aren't just for cars. They're a public right. space. What are streets for? Um, and I know bicycles are very much entitled legally to take up an entire lane and to block traffic because they're a vehicle on the yeah. road. And more generally, you know, we've been having conversations about streets being sites of protests, Black Lives Matter, and sites of, you know, these are public spaces we can reclaim, put patios on because of COVID and take up those streets. Now, with the quiet streets, with active TO, we're being reminded that we own the streets as well. They are our spaces. Great, and I I think if anything, um, Toronto, I think we can be more ambitious. I think this is the time. And um, like, you know, for those that think that, you know, these initiatives come out of nowhere, I think there's been quite some time that we've been thinking about using our streets differently and imagining our streets differently um, and having more livable people-centered approaches to designing our cities. You know, I moved here 20 years ago, a couple months ago, from oh. Windsor. This is Sean McAuliffe. And in Windsor, I was in a car probably every day of my life, because uh, it was the way to get around. Sean teaches at the University of Toronto, and also senior editor and co-owner of the independent magazine, Spacing. Uh, well, the more you walk the city, the more you realize this place is pretty big. And <laughs> there's a lot I have not walked. But, uh, but yeah, I was, I was kind of cynical about those um, quiet streets at first, you know. But um, they actually kind of work. Like you're saying, like that little sign and, and that forcing a driver to operate a little bit differently, right? It's not just a sign that yeah. says, watch out for kids, um, or even splash in, you know, the speed limit at them if you got one of those flashy signs. Um, it forces them to slow down and move around. So they're actually making that kind of physical gesture. Um, it is kind of great. And there is, a, there is like a method to how they laid them out. I know some did get a little political because I know some were put out and then locals told the councillor, we don't want that here. So they got removed in a handful of places, but they kind of connect from one neighborhood to another. Um, and I found on like long bike rides, uh, pandemic bike rides, just exploring the city because that's what we do you now. I'll, I'll see one and just sort of follow it and it'll lead me to another one or a neighborhood that I might not really have 
um, gone to on purpose. Um, so I've kind of liked them and I think they need to be permanent, uh, right? We have, for, for the longest time, we've had these like, say, cycling routes. Uh, you see the little blue signs, you know, this is yeah. cycling route 16, turn left, turn right. But it's just a little sign. Whereas this, it tells everyone that you belong. There are different ways of designing streets and cities and parks and paths. These things can be realizations of the imagination of the one who creates it. But they can also follow us, the public, how we want to use that space. This idea that if you just decide you're going to take a walking path through the city, you just, and go places you haven't been before, the depth of the city is so rich and unexpected because I'm finding that even doing my so-called power walks and initially it was because okay there's way too many people on that street I'm going to turn left you know and then I turn left and then there's way too many people on this street I'm going to turn right and I would just end up places that I that I wasn't expecting so how do you feel that this kind of access can change that connectedness of the city yeah I think people very easily get in our ruts you know when we're traveling through the city you know we have our, our familiar paths how to get to work how to get to friends houses um, family that sort of thing um, and it's actually hard to break out of them because we go where we know I think people need to be nudged out of that and absolutely will find like parts of the city that um, you didn't know existed I thought you know it's been my ridiculous job, for, partial job to explore the city for the last years um, for these various things that I do and the pandemic because we go for a walk every evening um, these kind of forced walks have kind of tightened the lens or my own I guess mental lens on the city and that I'm looking for like oh that's a passage I've never been down um, so it's like it, it becomes like an onion that um, this onion I thought I knew uh, quite well, yet has another layer and another layer and another layer. And maybe our movements, our desires to move, need to be more of a central piece in how we design our city and make it a humane place to live. What's been interesting over the pandemic is there has been a big conversation um, about uh, about equity in the public realm. Um, and it's like, it feels like before we were just trying to get like these little gains sometimes um, and public space was sort of not on the mainstream radar. It was like a niche thing, you know, like uh, of which I'm deeply in the niche. <laughs> I, can't <see> it. <laughs> I can't see out of the niche. Uh, whereas now it's, it's like everyone's problem you know because you go because space we all need more space and we're all kind of inhabiting it um those equity issues have really kind of come to a head now which i think is probably a way overdue reckoning the pandemic legacies i hope we're talking about them in years to come as things that did not go away and maybe next time it won't be because we're forced to do it but because it is the right way to create equitable, usable, healthy space. I am Madian Andrade. This is the new normal.